All right. Good day, folks. Thanks for coming to Finding Warmth for our son. I am Matthew Brong, your host here at Madison 365. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks for coming, folks. It's been a heck of a week and a um, lot of not fun things. So really this question or, or, or today going to be um, really digging into a, a bit more around police. Um, effectively, they become a stand in army, in 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 real ways, uh, and 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 we le- live in in a police state. Uh, I'm gonna be talking, uh, focusing a little bit more on, on police. If you want to hear the the, the kind of crux, uh, and particularly some much more of the of facts and 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 figures, particularly like the numbers and the data around defund and why it makes sense. Really, from a policy and economic uh, standpoint, uh, into funding other things, uh, there's a I have a cast on that uh, specifically. You know, defund the police and why it's not scary. But I want to talk about more of this and really laying out thoughts and ideas that we are living in a police state, and and particularly uh, depending on your socioeconomic status. Um, you know, the functional police and continuing in in this idea of the functional police society. Effectively, right now, most states and municipalities don't really have much power in in a real sense over police. They kind of do what they want to do. Even what we see in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, a federal judge said both uh, uh, Brooklyn Center and Minneapolis police cannot use tear gas and, and have also uh, implemented a temporary restraining orders for uh, police and, and 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 press, and they violated both of those. Yet they continue to operate with no accountability for their actions. One of them, uh, the use of tear gas, is indeed a banned weapon in warfare, and they continue to do this stuff. And really, the the only mechanisms of of oversight these legislatures have is with the purse strings, with budgets, and they're refusing to exercise these things. And there's other mechanisms of oversight, but they they don't. People aren't. There has been some movement on defund, but it's 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 pennies to the dollar on on what a lot of these police budgets are. Not to mention the 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 really complicated structures of our law enforcement of federal, state. Uh, county and and municipal jurisdictions uh, intersecting in really weird ways. It's a a massive, massive, uh, complex institution uh, that is far beyond anything a reform. It's 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 a it's a hydra. It's a monster that is beyond control. That the really only land place you can land on is is abolition, and and even parts of abolition you can get into it with with some some folks will be uh, with the idea of abolition and that we need to uh, reimagine public safety and what it means, uh, particularly in investing in education, health, uh, housing, uh, uh, you know, anti poverty measures, securing people's livelihoods, um, things that would address a lot of crimes, particularly since most crimes are not violent crimes. Most crimes are, are particularly property or inter, are, are property crimes. Um, and even violent interpersonal crimes uh, aren't uh, horrible. Uh, there are some some absolutely horrible violent interpersonal crimes. They're talking about sex abuse and interpersonal uh, intimate partner violence and, and, and those types of things. Um, that are absolutely horrible, but police aren't even great at, at, at preventing or stopping or investigating and, and holding people accountable for those. So really this idea is that if you invest um, in things that improve people's livelihoods, as well as access to trauma care and support for victims and removal from victims, less on the hard police and we need to beat them with the stick end um, and punishment end will, will be much more effective. And, and again, police aren't even effective in what we, we ask them to do. But there's no accountability or oversight of police in, in, in real ways. There's so much latitude, even in the ability to hold them accountable in the, in the ways that we have accountability on them. That outside of that is, is just massive, unrestricted behavior. But this institution was, was formed 
to protect wealthy white ruling class at the expense of everybody else, especially black and brown folk. Uh, the professionalization of this force grew out kind of twofold. You had in, in the North um, really taking on the, the ideas of, of town watchers and, and um, you know, that grew out of Britain. In the South, you had slave catchers. But these things weren't separate, uh, particularly when you had uh, the, the federal slave laws um, that were implemented that deputized basically every white citizen, but particularly those that uh, were growing as what we ended up calling police and law enforcement in these municipalities became slave catchers. And a, a lot of folks were also um, black folks that were dubbed uh, ex- escaped slaves weren't actually escaped slaves. They're free men that were then enslaved um, due to this. So that that interweaving of enforcing the color line was woven into policing quite early all across the country, not just in the South with slave catchers. And then as the labor movement started to grow in the late 1800s, you, you also saw an expansion of professional police forces as uh, moneyed elites wanted better protection of their property, better protection of their companies as they faced uh, labor strikes. And originally they leaned on private entities like the Pinkertons and other such things, but then they um, made public police forces. They pressured um, such things around public police forces around, you saw things around vagrancy laws and, and, and other things that were one disproportionately targeted black folks and brown folks, um, but a lot of the, the growth, the growth really around the prof- professionalization of police uh, was in two parts, maintaining the color line, enforcing the color line in this country, and enforcing the class line. And that is the origin of policing, particularly in this country, that we have also exported across the globe. The main role of police in society is rooted in protecting the white wealthy ruling class and then but they've become a hydra of their own um, but that, that that's where their allegiance lies uh and we see this even in the fact that that law enforcement all across the country went in and um donated money to uh the, the, what's his name the kid that that that, that killed protesters in, in in kenosha saying we support you you we stand with you donated to him Extrajudicial killing, uh, not just extrajudicial, but but a, a um, but we but this isn't new. It's 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 uh, really civilian that was in enforcing uh, the color line in this country, and oftentimes, more often than not, law enforcement um, has worked with civilians um, reinforcing the color line or or supportive, basically non-state entities um, have been. Uh, at times unofficially authorized to help enforce the call line. This was, you know, part of actually judicial killings with lynchings um, and, and race riots, um, you know, and, and, and beyond. This is a, 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 a very large aspect of the history of police in this country is the unofficial authorization of non-state entities to help their enforcement and the overlooking of this. Many times these same people are friends with officers as they do it. White gangs are part of this. And some of the first white gangs actually in in Chicago as part of this were ended up becoming police officers, the police force, or becoming, um, um, you know, part of the state. And and that's, you know, some of the the, the deeply crook-rooted politics in Chicago um, were were empowered by by effectively white gangs. And, and and a lot of the first black gangs came into existence, black and brown gangs came into existence to protect communities from police and, and these these uh, uh, extra state actors of, of, of white gangs. So this is, this is what they are. So the only way forward is to abolish this and to reimagine public safety and what it means to be safe. And the safest communities don't have more police. They have more resources. Think about that. What are the safest communities? They don't have police on every block. They don't have police patrolling all the time. They have access to more resources. And of course, police 
at their beck and uh, call um, to enforce the class and color line to those that, that so-called don't belong. So really, when it comes down to it, it's the institution, stupid. Like, it's, it's just the institution. It's what it is. They're all varying degrees of bad, such as Madison Love to people point out, well, they're more progressive. You, you, it's, it's just bad. It's just less bad than others, but it's still bad. And it's, it's beyond individual officers, too. I'm sure there's, there's many individual officers that are individually good people, but their job is, is, is a bad job. It's a, it's a job. It's a position. It's an institution that does bad things. It goes beyond the individual. And there really aren't any good cops. Again, there's no such thing as a good cop. There's good people that might be cops. But they aren't good cops. Because otherwise they would be arguing for the abolition of their own job. Because police and the society aren't in that positive. They're in that negative. When you, you factor in the cost, how much harm and, and death and terror they cause upon so many folks in this country, millions in this country, not effectively actually doing their job, it's a net negative. We need to reimagine what public safety is. Police lie over and over again, too. Yet the media and many people who aren't even uh, hardline blue lies matter folk believe and take them at their word. I mean, shoot, the media... The, the, there's a great article about how um, I think it's New York Times or or, um, or or Washington Post, basically about talking about how didn't even need to know the police were lying about Adam Toledo, whose story changed, who's on arm running your shot and following orders. What he may or may not have before he was shot and killed doesn't matter. She was unarmed at the moment of him being killed and following orders. And the the, the argument um, that the police are putting forward on this is that. Um, they had no choice ex- because he was moving with his hands up and following orders. In Knoxville, there's a police killing at a school this, this week that was dubbed a, a, a school shooting. Uh, the original statement was that this, this, this child shot an officer, but it's shown that this child's gun wasn't the one that hit an officer. And they lied about it. And, and, and some of, and basically uh, the police are denying uh, the release of the body cam images of this, photos of this. And they lie. And they're, they're also granted the ability to make mistakes in life or death situations. When we wouldn't, uh, 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 you know, let this happen. And we don't let this happen in, in really any other profession, a pilot, made a mistake on on the correct gear or correct thing to, to put when landing and all of a sudden killing people or a surgeon mistaking something, killing somebody, they would face consequences. But somebody can, there's a, a pattern that is like the, the, the mistaking a taser for a gun is not the first time this happened. That's not the first time uh, uh, that's happened. There seems to be an increasing pattern of this and in, increasing kind of training of this. Again, cops lie. And actually, in fact, they're trained. There's trainings to train cops about how to get away with killing people. They train themselves to get away with killing people. They're game. They're granted the ability to make so-called accidental killings. No other profession is granted that. And civilians are held to a higher standard of conduct when they're interacting with police than police are when they're interacting with civilians. They say it's a high stress job and these are high stress situations, yet they're supposed to be trained to handle them. No other job do we make that excuse about inability to handle high stress situations. If you're a surgeon, you can't handle being high stress, high pressure. You can't be, you're not a good surgeon. You're out. If you're a pilot, you can't handle it. You're out. People have been court-martialed for less. And we're told civilians' best chance to handle a police encounter, to live through a police encounter, is to shrink your cells, to survive, to show themselves in the face of the law, to obey, to always obey, to kneel and lick the boot 
risk beating tasers or being killed. And yet we see even at times when you do obey, you're not always guaranteed to survive. There's been multiple times we've seen evidence of this. The whole idea of stop resisting, like it, it's just, it's madness. It's absolutely madness. And a lot of this stuff isn't being equally applied either. There's mountains of evidence of white folks acting wild with police, striking them, hitting them. There's just a, a guy just dragged a, a police in his car. This white guy, he wasn't killed. He didn't obey. Quantitative, we know this too. In, in most metro areas, black folks are, are killed at a higher rate, even adjusted for arrest rates, which are racist too. But multiple studies have shown this. Fatal shootings by U.S. police officers in 2015 in Bird Eyes View, which is a study. You can Google it. Again, fatal shootings by police officers in 2015 in Bird Eyes View. Studies show that police fatally shoot unarmed black men at disproportionate rates. They also noted that police shootings do not correlate with crime rate, neighborhood violence, age, or mental illness. Now, there's a lot of this stuff, particularly on, on um, multiple articles written over and over again about this, this data and, and racism in this country. Um, a, a great kind of snarky one um, that I pulled that from uh, Michael Harriet from The Root wrote an article called Maybe America is Racist, laying out really inciting data and numbers about all the ways racism presents in America. Yet, yet again, the most recent column of black writers and thinkers and scholars to present this, it's, it's presented, this information is presented from everything from, from, from studies and scholarly articles and, and research papers, media members, and, and, and again, thinkers and writers. If this was any other subject, this wouldn't be a debate, particularly about the, 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 the levels of institutional, structural, and systemic racism. The amount of data we have about how deep racism is and how it presents itself, particularly as, as, as power, and who has it and who doesn't have it, is so deep. Yet it is one of the only subjects that is, is, is not the only, but one of like a small select, but these are all... Um, so-called non-kitchen table subjects or, or woke politics or, you know, um, uh, uh, um, you know, people participating in the culture war or racial grievances and, 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 and these, these pejoratives about these things that we bring up and the numbers back us up. Us so-called social justice warriors and, and, and woke warriors and whatever pejorative you want to or, or, or potentially think up, like the data backs us up, backs us up. If this was climate change, a lot of these same folks looking at the data we have would, would dismiss and do dismiss people arguing against climate change and the things that need to be done and the gravity of the situation. Yet we are constantly dismissed when we present this evidence. Qualitative, quantitatively, anecdotally, like it's, 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 it's mountains upon mountains and mountains of it. And the only way to deny it is, 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 is through cognitive dissonance and, and, and hoops and weird rationalizations and dismissiveness. Why do you hear the other side? There is no other side. But it really, this, this is really is, is far beyond that. It's, it's really how this episode is really how law enforcement, through, say, a asset forfeiture, has taken more property from private citizens than through burglaries. This is according to the Institute of Justice and FBI crime reporting data. Laws for asset forfeiture are so loose and, and can devise and they can devise up really so many different reasons to effectively steal your own property. It's about how Baltimore cop, a Baltimore cop with cop, cops were just found carrying guns to plan on people that they shoot. These, again, this is only what we know about and what's found, and there's so much more because of the, the, the blue code of silence and the blue line that we don't know. Chicago PD has had multiple torture sites in their history, torture sites. They use CIA, the most latest home in square, use CIA torture techniques, black sites that they disappear, detain people to. Nobody was held accountable for that one. The first one, some people were barely held accountable. It's about how some training departments use cutouts of kids holding guns so they can reduce hesitancy when they shoot and kill kids. 
There's an, again, it's about how entire trainings designed for police to, to legally get away with killing and murdering people. The perpetual harassment of black and brown people for things as silly as air fresheners and plate lights that might be out. And, and made up excuses. I mean, it's, it's, it's how Fairfax County just had 400 convictions thrown out because of one cop who was accused of stealing drugs from the police property room and planting drugs on innocent people and stopping motorists without legal basis. These court filings. Yet, they, this officer is allowed to resign in good standing and now can get a job being a police officer elsewhere. These things are just scratching the surface. Ellie, in, in, in California, there are two departments we know of that have had internal gangs of officers making scratches on their badges for people they kill, taking a kill count. In L- LAPD, an officer was suspended for killing a homeless person. This officer was harassing, well, the officer was drunk at 3 a.m., That's it. Suspended. Well, they're off duty, drunk, and killed somebody that they decided to harass. It's how many of us aren't even sure uh, Officer Chauvin will be found guilty in Minneapolis. How there's doubt upon that. How there's all this evidence that he's on that man's neck. George Floyd's neck for nine minutes with a smirk on his face. It's how Brooklyn, Brooklyn Center uh, a PD last night surrounded a church that was harboring protesters that were injured to stop protesters from going in. They, again, continued to attack the press, disobeying a federal judge court order. They've arrested medics. That's considered a war crime. This isn't isolated. In D.C., just last night, there's a, a, a protest, a, a march. They marched. It was peaceful. And, and we'll get to a second how that's a misnomer. They're peaceful. And as they dispersed after it was done, they moved in and attacked and beat these protesters as they're dispersing. But the n- misnomer of this, this, this idea that they're peaceful is that they're protesting because violence already occurred. Violence occurred by the state. But we don't label that as violence. Police are, are a standing army. They're a standing army that can do whatever they want without accountability, without any real, real accountability. And they're not good at their job. Even their stated job, most crimes go unreported. Most crimes go unsolved. Or should I say most reported crimes go unsolved, particularly sex crimes, intimate partner crimes, and property crimes. They don't even address the social ills that are asked to respond to. They don't do these things. An unregulated gang running across the United States. And those who hold the purse strings are failing to do anything out of fear, out of I don't know what. And so many folks in this country, black, brown, white, Asian, Still hold them in high regard. Still give them the benefit of the doubt. Still believe more police will solve the problems. Yet even, even then, these, these, some of these survey questions are weird as, as they say, do you want, you know, do you believe police make neighborhoods safer? And, but they don't get down onto what people want policing to be. And yet the majority of people still support the reallocation of money from police departments into other things like housing and mental health services. They may not support the slogan defund, but they support the policy of defund. But really the only logical conclusion is abolition. This, these institu- this institution, this law enforcement institution, and, and really our entire justice system is profoundly unjust, profoundly violent, profoundly oppressive. This is a standing army. This is a police state. And if we don't comply, we die. And even when we comply, sometimes we die. It's beyond reform. It's so far beyond reform. It's looking at the history, it's beyond reform. Looking at the present, it's beyond reform. You can't reform this. It's just degrees of terrible. 
And it's siphoning money away, particularly from municipalities that have limited budgets and states as well. They're militarized and out of control. Abolish. And that is it for this week. Thanks for coming to Final War and Thor's Son. I'm Matthew Brongan, your host here at Madison 365. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Um, get a vaccine, mask up. Stay safe out there, folks. And I uh, hope you're taking care of yourselves all right. Have a good one. This is 365 Media.